اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ورحمت اللہ ویلکم ٹو دا فرسٹ لیکچر آف ویک فائیو ان دا لاسٹ ویک وی ور ڈسکسنگ چیپٹر نمبر 19 دیٹ از بلک ڈیفارمیشن پروسیس ان دا چیپٹر وی ہیو ڈسکسڈ دا رولنگ آپریشن ناؤ ان دس ویک وی آر گوئنگ ٹو ڈسکس دا فورجنگ اینڈ ایکسٹروجن پروسیس سو لیٹ اسٹارٹ وتھ دا فورجنگ ون as it is a type of the deformation process so the work is compressive in nature it's a deformation process in which the work is compressed between the two dies and we have discussed this before as well that the deformation processes are compressive in nature except in some cases for example why on the bar drawing where we apply the tensile forces so the forging operation is one of the oldest form of metal forming process that dates back to 5000 bc and some common parts that can be made using the forging operation and that are still being made using the forging operation includes the engine, crankshaft, connecting rods, gears, aircraft structural components and some jet engine parts. So it can make parts ranging from very complex shapes to the simple inwards. So forging operation can be classified based on three parameters the first one is the temperature and we have discussed this before that all the deformation processes can be performed as a hot working and the cold working so the first one is based on the temperature second one is based on the type of force being applied and the third one is based on the type of forging dies right so in the type of forging die we have uh, open die forging uh, we can have the impression die forging or the flashless forging we will discuss these types in the next slide so we have the uh, based on temperature we have the hot forging or the cold forging as uh, as we know that in the hot forging our primary concern or objective is the significant deformation of the shape change and due to the hot forging we reduce the strength of the material but increase the ductility in the work material while in the case of the f cold working or the cold forging our primary objective is to increase the strength of the work part using by the strain hardening based on the type of force forging can be divided into two types the first one is the impact forging and second one is the press forging so the impact forging are performed using the forging hammer while the press forging are performed using the forging press so in impact forging the load applied on the work part is impact load so what is the impact load that is load applied for an instant or the force applied for an instant or for a short period of time that is a impact load while in the case of the press forging using the forge press we apply the pressure gradually so these are the two classification for the forging operation the third one is the type of the forging dies that has open die forging impression die forging and the flashless forging so in the case of the open die forging we have the two dies two flat dies and the work part is comprised between the two dies and there is no restriction to the metal to flow laterally the metal has a liberty to flow laterally when being compressed in the case of the impression die forging uh, die surface contain a cavity or impression so we have a die cavity that has some impression over it that we want to impart onto our work part so that is the impression dies one thing is that in this kind of the forging the metal flows into the gap between the two dies as you can see here so this extra metal in the gap between the two dies is known as the flesh there are certain advantages of the flesh as well which we will discuss in the next slide that the third one is a flashless forging uh, it is also known as a closed die forging in which there is no chance of uh, there is no formation of flesh 
Now one thing we need to care of is that we need to feed the material carefully taking into consideration the volume in the die cavity so the equal amount of volume should be fed so what is the open diforging as we have seen in open diforging you have the two flat dies and the work part is being compressed between the dies the force is being applied in this direction compression so deformation reduces height and increases diameter of work so obviously when you are applying the pressure the height is being reduced but at the same time it is metal is flowing laterally so which increases the height as you can uh, demonstrate at your home as well if you compress something it uh, flows laterally it diameter increases its thickness increases if the height is decreased so the common names for the open die forging is upsetting or upset forging this is the ideal case that is uh, there is no friction between the dies and the work part so in this case the homogeneous uh, it will material, material will experience the homogeneous deformation that means when the, there is a there will be increase in diameter laterally and it will increase homogeneously let's suppose if you have reduced the height of this one so it will transform into I can just uh, reduce the height so it will transform into this one as you can see here the height has been has been reduced here and the diameter has been increased right but the metal has deformed homogeneously that there is no uh, inhomogeneous deformation what is inhomogeneous deformation like what if our work part is like this like this one so the deformation is not homogeneous here the some part has flown greater while some the metal in some part has in some regions hasn't flown that much compared to the other regions so that is the inhomogeneous deformation and we have experienced homogeneous deformation but obviously that is the ideal case when we have no friction between the work part and the die what if there is a friction between the work part and the die cavity uh, let us discuss this one first if there is a friction between the work part and the die cavity then it will experience some inhomogeneous in deformation like this one so so when you are performing the forging process there is some deformation in the dimension so the strain based on this deformation we can write it as strain equals to natural log of that is a true strain h naught initial height divided by HF or simply H that is a true strain so based on this we have the we can calculate the forging force as you know force is equals to stress into area so in this case we have the flow stress into the area and here this area is the cross sectional area right and why if for the hot working if you are performing the hot working n would be equal to 0 and y f will be reduced to yield strength of that material right so this is our forging force and if there is a hot working performed then our strain hardening experiment would be zero and the flow stress would be equal to the yield strength of that material and we have studied what the yield strength is in the last lecture when you were discussing in the last week when you were discussing the rolling operation and the strain strain stress strain and diagram so what if there is a friction between the die cavity and the work part 
if there's friction between the die cavity and the work part and an effect comes into play that is called as the barreling effect that is known as the barreling effect right so what happens uh, let's suppose you're performing the hot working and our work part is at very high temperature while our die cavity or the die is uh, are at the room temperature so when they both comes in contact with each other it starts to cool down from the outer surface because because of the rate uh, because of the heat transfer at the contact surface uh, the outer surface of the work part starts to freeze but the inner side of the work part is still hot so once we apply the pressure although the outer surface tries to retain its shape because of some solidification while the molten material deep inside or the near molten material deep inside when we apply the pressure it flows laterally and because uh, the material at these edges are in contact with the die cavity so there is a rapid solidification here so the flow of metal is less near the die cavity while the flow of metal is maximum toward the center away from the die cavity so that's why we have a bulging of our work part this bulging effect is known as the barreling effect you can say this bulging of work part is called as the barreling effect so obviously um, this change there's a change in shape and an inhomogeneous deformation so it also affects the force that is required that is required to perform the forging operation as we know that the force equals to flow stress into the cross sectional area but here we can see that there is an increase in cross sectional area as well and there is a change in the shape of the work part as well so they both have increased the force required so to account when we take into account this change in the shape and in how much is deformation we add another factor that is called the shape factor and the forging force would be equals to kf yf into a what is kf kf is the shape factor and that is equals to 1 plus 0.4 into the uh, friction coefficient divided by h so so friction coefficient d is the diameter or any other contact surface and h is the height or any other dimension that is weak reduced right so d is the diameter the contact surface of the die cavity and h is the height or the dimension that is being reduced so this is our final formula when you take the inhomogeneous transfer deformation into account or the change in shape into account so that is known as the barreling effect so in the open die forging work is deformed into a contoured cross section rather than the flat rectangular shapes right so uh, that is not always the case that we uh, deform the work part uh, on the flat surface rather we have some uh, application in which we prepare the material for some further processing so in the in some cases of open die forging we prepare the material for further processing so there is some contoured shape of dies uh, to accomplish some grain flow in the specific direction right our primary purpose for these contoured surfaces in the die cavity is to achieve grain flow and metallurgical structure in our favor you can write to create a favorable
So for, for this purpose, in the open die forging, we have some specialized form of dies. Uh, the first one is called as the flurry. That is known as the flurry. Then we have the edging. In the flooring, we have a convex shaped die cavity. It's a type of forging operation which we have the convex shaped die cavity, and its two function is to reduce the cross section and to redistribute the metal in a work part. Right? So it reduces the dimension from the cross section and redistribute the grain flow. Then, for the similar purpose, we have another one that's called the the forging operation with this kind of die cavity is called as the edging or we have the last one is cogging and the last one is known as the cogging cogging is also known as the incremental forging let's suppose we have the long bar and uh, like this one and it has some thickness T0 and we want to reduce the thickness of whole bar to some Ti so what will you do we will incrementally hammer this uh, bar along its whole length so this incremental forging is called as a cogging because these are some specialized type of the open die forging operation now for the case of the impression die forging uh, that is also known as a closed die forging uh, compression of work part by dies with inverse of the desired shape as we have discussed uh, previously that the die cavity has the inverse of the shape the flesh is formed by the metal uh, it goes into the gap between the die cavity so and this flesh will be trimmed away when the operation is has been completed but there are certain advantages of this flesh formation what happens uh, especially in the hot working when the metal is in the uh, near molten state so when we apply the pressure this metal flow flows into this cavity and rapidly cool down so it creates a barrier for the metal inside to flow further rather it will exert some compressive forces onto the metal so this compression or this enclosed area uh, because of this flash formation creates a compressive force onto the metal in the die cavity so this compression helps to fill all the intricate or the fine geometries within the die cavity let's suppose we have not uh, we don't have a simple die cavity rather we have a die cavity with some minor details so this compression will help the metal to flow into those minor details so this is one of the advantage of the uh, flash formation and in hot forging it obviously it stops the flow of the metal so this is the advantage of the flash formation and it is to be cut away after the process has been completed so there are certain limitations and advantages for this one if we go on to the limitation we in the case of the impression die forging the production rate is higher if we compare it to the machining from the solid stock so the production rate in the impression die forging is comparatively higher the conservation of metal uh, we have a very less waste of the material in the forging operation in bulk deformation as process as a whole the waste metal is less as we have discussed in the first lecture because of the compression uh, during the process it has a greater strength and we can have a favorable clean orientation let's suppose we are using a part uh, that requires uh, that will undergo higher forces in some region and lower forces in some other region so we will uh, we can arrange the metallurgical structure or we can arrange the flow of grains in our favorable direction so that we can have a higher strength in the particular regions of that part so it can bear the higher forces but this facility is not available when you are performing the machining one as you can see here this one is made from the forging operation and this is made from the machining operation so the, we have the radial grain orientation in this region is some radial grain orientation in this region for the higher strength and we have some uh, straight flow of the grains while in the case of the machining 
the green flow is uniform throughout the part and obviously that is not uh, favorable because all the regions are not going to experience the same amount of forces uh, there is some limitation to the impression drive forging as well uh, it does not have capability of close tolerance means we have to uh, adjust the dimension after the process we don't get very precise dimension uh, machine is often required for this one uh, and especially when we require features such as we want to create holes or threads or other meeting surface to fit with other components so we do require machining at the end in the case of impression drive forging but that's not always the case when we are dealing with some complex shapes so we do require, do require the machining towards the end of the impression die forging process then let's jump to the impression die forging practices although several forming steps are required in the impression die forging it's not the case that we achieve a shape in a single step rather we have multiple steps to achieve the shape in the impression die forging and we use the same formula uh, as in the case of the open die forging but its interpret interpretation is slightly different uh, this equation applies to the maximum force during the operation right? and uh, this force is taken to be maximum uh, during the operation so that's why we assume it uh, we consider the uh, lowest or the you can say maximum strain that is that can be produced in this operation or that is required in operation while calculating the force uh, why we consider the maximum strain uh, because so that we can have the maximum force that is required and based on that maximum force we can check out if our machining uh, if our machine forging plant is capable to exert that amount of force on the work part so that is why uh, that is a maximum force that is applied during the operation because it will determine the capacity of the forging press or the hammer so based on this value we will determine how much capacity of forging press or hammer do we require for our operation and we have discussed the maximum force uh, is reached at the end of the forging stroke why is that so because at the end of the forging stroke we have the maximum strain uh, that is produced or we have the maximum strain hardening as well that is produced toward the end of the stroke and also the contact area with the die cavity has also increased so the friction have also, has also increased so there are multiple factors that contribute to the increase in the forging force towards the end of the stroke so while uh, dealing with the impression die forging we have some certain predefined values for the shape factor that is if we have simple uh, shapes of the flesh that is 6 we have some complex shapes with the flesh that is equals to 8 or we have very complex shape with the flesh that is equals to 10 and some fleshless forging we can have 6 or 8 now the last type of the forging process is the fleshless forging as we have discussed in this kind of the forging process die is in a, cl in a closed cavity there is no chance of flesh formation it is also known as a push, uh, closed die forging so one thing we need to take care of that the starting part volume must be equal to the die cavity volume right so the, whatever the volume you are feeling it should be equal to the die cavity volume you should increase that so the process control more demanding than the impression die forging so we have to have more control over the work part we are feeding the amount we are feeding and the force we are exerting but at the end the geometries we get are very symmetrical or oh, we can have a very uh, controlled geometry in the case of the flash flash forging uh, when we perform at very high tolerances uh, close tolerances we call this flash flash forging to be the precision flash uh, forging process some common types uh, that are uh, common parts that are used using the, using the flashless forging is, is the coining uh, a special type of forging process in which uh, we impart some details onto the top and bottom surface of the part the coins we use in our daily life as a currency so it has some details impart onto the top and the bottom that is the uh, example of flashless forging so let's jump to the machine uh, which I use in the forging process 
as you have discussed, uh, we have two kinds of the forging processes based on the force applied. The first one is the impact forging, and the second one is the press forging. So, in the impact forging, we apply the impact load, and that impact load is applied using the forge hammer. We have two types: the forge hammer and the forge press. So, the apply impact load against the work part. So the impact forging is performed using the forging hammer and you have two types of forging hammers. The first one is a gravity drop hammer, second one is a power drop hammer. A gravity drop hammer in which impact energy is uh, achieved from the falling weight of a heavy ram. So we have a very heavy ram here and because of its uh, weight we uh, achieve the uh, obtain the required energy for the impact out of the work part. While in the case of the power drop hammer uh, the ram is accelerated using the pressurized air or stream or the fluids. So one of the common disadvantages for the impact uh, forging is that the impact it exerts onto the work part is transferred on the floor of the building. So, so we need to have some basement of or the base of this forging hammer to avoid or to absorb the energy that is being transferred towards the floor. Some common process that are performed using the impact hammer is the impression die forging. So if you observe the diagram, we have the anvil that is a base and on the anvil we place the work part and we have the ram that moves or the tool you can say and we have the frame that is carrying all the uh, mechanism for moving the hammer or the ram and we, and we have the head containing the cylinder. The second one is the forging press, the press forging in which a uh, gradual pressure is applied to complete the compression, press, uh, comp uh, compression. So we have three mechanisms for performing this operation, either mechanically, hydraulically or the screw mechanism. In mechanically, we have the drive motor and linear motion of ram, like in the case of the, uh, we can say motor, we have our drive view and the linear motion that is a mechanical press uh, we have the hydraulic one uh, in which we exert pressure using the uh, hydraulic pressure and the third one is the screw mechanism which drives the ram so in this uh, we have the frame we have the press stroke here and the connecting rod between the ram and the press stroke we have the guide ram here which guides the ram and uh, we have the die cavity and the forging table that absorbs the energy. So this is the forging process uh, in the bulk deformation. So we will start with the practical problems. So let's start with this numerical. Uh, it says a cylindrical workpiece is subjected to cold upset forging. So it's a cold forging. Uh, it means it will, it will have some strain hardening. The starting piece is 75 mm in height and 50 mm in diameter. It is reduced in operation to a height of 36 mm. The work part has a flow curve of 350 MPa and the strain hardening exponent of 0.17. Assume friction coefficient of 0.1 and says determine the force as the process begins at intermediate height of 62 and 49 and the final height of 36. So we have a starting cylindrical workpiece. Uh, let's make a cylindrical workpiece here. Right. And it says it has a starting piece at a 75 millimeter height. And 50 millimeter in diameter. Right. It is to be reduced to a height of 36 mm. Right. It is reduced to a height of 36 mm. And some x diameter. As we know, the diameter will increase when we reduce the height. Right. It says the strain hardening exponent is this and this. So we need to find out force as the process begins. Uh, 
the force at h equals to 62 the force at h equals to 49 and the force at h equals to 36 millimeter so we'll start by calculating the volume of the work part because the volume is always constant when you perform the deformation process so we have cylindrical part so we have pi d square h or pi d square h by 4 so we it's equal to pi into 50 square divided by 4 into 75 millimeter so the value is 147 262 mm cube. At the moment, one is made by the upper die that has h equal to 75 and the force. So uh, now it says calculate the force at the beginning of the process. So in the beginning of the process, the die has just come in contact with the work part. I has just come in contact with the work part and it has started to apply the pressure. So for the ductile material, if we see, just leave it for now, uh, what will be the force that is required? Force equals to Yf into A, right? We are not adding the uh, factor for uh, compression, right? Uh, for the beginning of the force, so we will have yf equals to k epsilon into x1 and n. We know what the k is, but we are not what will be the strain because a process has just begun. So if we draw the stress strain curve for a ductile material, For ductile material, if we are not aware about the exact value of the uh, yield point or the strain, so what we do, we take offset of 0 0.002 of strain, that is 0 0.002 of the strain, and we draw a parallel line to this stress strain curve. We keep on draw this parallel line and the point where it strikes that is the yield point of that material so from this point there will be a beginning of deformation there will be a beginning of deformation so it means at the beginning of the deformation we have the strain equals to 0 0.002 so we will take the strain value at the beginning of the process equals to 0 0.002 that's what I did we are discussing the first one the beginning of the process right so the yf would be equal to the k is 350 and that is 0 0.002 and the strain hardening exponent is 0 0.17 so that would be equal to 121.7 megapascal so now the diameter is approximately 50 mm we know the diameter is equals to 50 mm and the area the, that is in contact with the die cavity that would be equals to pi d square by 4 and it would be equals to pi 50 square by 4 that is equals to 1963.5 millimeter square. So now we will calculate the shape factor because once the deformation has started, there will be a slight change in shape as well. So we will take that shape factor into account that is equals to Kf uh, 1 plus 0 0.4 into 0 0.1 that is a friction coefficient into 50 that is a diameter. 
divided by the height that is 75 the 1.027 that is the value of the uh, shear factor as you can see the shear factor is just approximately equal to 1 so there's very little effect the shape has a uh, slightly deformed so we can calculate the forging force as the process begins so our forging force at the beginning of the process would be equal to shape factor into the flow stress into area so it would be equal to 1.027 into the yf what is the yf here 121.7 into the cross sectional area that is 1963.5 so the force at the beginning of the process would be 4 at the beginning of the process is uh, 245410 megapascal this, this, this is the value of the force at the beginning of the process now the second part it says calculate the force when the during the deformation when the height reaches at 62 millimeter let's suppose we are deforming the part and now the current height is 62 millimeter of this cylindrical body so what is the force required for further deformation so we'll just leave the volume and I'm erasing the rest So, for the second part, at h equals to 62 millimeter. So, the strain value will be, now what is the initial height? The initial height is 75, the final height is 62. Because we are finding out the force at the 62 millimeter. So, what will be the strain value? That is ln of 1.21 and ln of 1.21 is equals to 0 0.1904. So, we will have the flow stress equals to 350 that is flow curve of k and uh, one, 0 0.1904 that is a strain and exponent n that is a friction coefficient that is 0 0.17 you will have the value of 264 Megapascal. This is the value of the flow curve, of the flow uh, stress. Now, as we have the constant volume, so if the height is being reduced, the diameter will increase, right? So, what was the original area? What was the previous area we had calculated? It was equals to. Just write it down. The our original area was 1963.15 meter square at that time. So to calculate the current diameter, we know that to find out the current area, we will divide the volume because volume is constant. Uh, divide by the height because we know the height. The volume is constant throughout the process and we have divided the volume by the height we will get the area so that is what was the volume that was 147262 divided by the height and the height is 62 for this one so the remaining what is left is the area that is 2375.2 millimeter square
so using this area we can calculate the diameter as you know that uh, cross sectional area is equals to pi d square by 4 or we have 4 a divided by pi equals to d we can have diameter equals to 4 into 2 375.2 divided by pi under root so the diameter is equals to 55 millimeter this is the value of the diameter at the height equals to 62 millimeter so based on this diameter and this height we can calculate the shape factor the shape factor would be equals to 1 plus 0 0.4 into 0 0.1 into 55 whole divided by 62 so the kf equals to 1.035 so now we have the shape factor we have the flow stress and we have the area so based on these we can calculate the force shape factor 1.035 into the flow stress that is 264 into this process area so our force will be 4 is equals to 649 303 newtons so this is our force that is required to reduce the height of the cylindrical part from 75 to the 62 millimeter and in the same way we can calculate for the 49 and the 36 millimeter so this is the end of this lecture should you have any questions you may reach me at the Google classroom or you can directly email me assalamualaikum